Thank you, Jimmy. Welcome everybody to uh, this week's edition of Office Hours with Dave and Anita. Um, this week we're going to have a discussion um, on kind of the future of microbiology related to wine. And we have uh, four distinguished guests with us today. The first guest that we have is uh, Professor Ben Montpetit. Um, ben has an undergraduate degree from Simon Fraser University in Canada and his PhD from University of British Columbia. He did a postdoc at uh, University of California at Berkeley, the other UC down the road a little bit. Um, and then was a professor at the University of Alberta until he joined us about, what Ben, about five years ago or so? Only been four. Whoa. <laughs> oh, year, no. Four years ago. Um, Feels like longer or what? <laughs> and he he uh, just got uh, tenure in our department, so That's we're why very it proud seems of him. Like He's now actually, as of tomorrow, be associate professor. Yeah, Yay. tomorrow. Yay! Today uh, I still have to say yes to things. Tomorrow I start saying no. Oh, well, <laughs> we snuck this in today. Um, <laughs> our second guest is Lucy Joseph, who's been in our department a long time as our culture curator. Lucy has. Uh, uh, undergraduate degree from Oregon State University and a master's in microbiology from UC Davis um, and a longtime uh, contributor to our extension programs in the department in terms of wine microbiology. Um, our next guest is Kiria Boundy Mills. Um, Kiria is the director of the FAF Culture Collection. It's a, cult, uh, I'm sure she'll talk more about it, but a yeast collection, extensive yeast collection here at UC Davis, um, home with the home in the Department of Food Science and Technology. Um, Kuria has a degree from undergraduate degree from Hope College and got her PhD at the University of Minnesota in biochemistry. And I will say that, um, well, I should introduce our last speaker. Our last speaker is Professor Dave Mills, uh, who is the Shields Endowed Chair and uh, in both the Food Science and Technology Department and the Department of Viticulture and Technology. Um, he got his undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin and then degrees in biochemistry and microbiology, including his PhD at the University of Minnesota. And um, I have to say, I've known Dave and Kiria for a really long time. We actually met in graduate school when uh, Dave was working in the next lab over from me uh, when, when I was doing my PhD and uh, Kiria was working on yeast and all the yeast groups used to get together on campus. So it's actually great to have them not only at UC Davis, but here on our program and, today. And we used to both have hair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was a little less gray than this too. <laughs> so with that, that's a lot of introduction. With that, what I'd like to do is, um, so we're going to have the four of them um, uh, give brief, or actually three of them are giving brief presentations. Uh, if you think of questions along the way that you'd like to ask, you're welcome to jot them down in the chat and we'll ask them. You can also, in the participants panel, raise the, click on the little blue hand to raise your hand or just unmute and ask a question, whatever works for you. Um, and so hopefully our presentations will last a total of 25 minutes or so and we'll have plenty of time to answer questions from the group. And so with that, I'd like to uh, actually turn it over to Ben Montpetit, who's going to talk uh, first about the future of wine microbiology. So go ahead, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So when you know, Karen approached us about uh, talking about something uh, wine microbiology related, I thought you know, might, the, might, the most interesting conversation might be one around uh, the future. Um, so in, in part, that kind of motivates the, the people that are here, both people who have focused on wine in the past, Dave Mills, Lucy, uh, myself more recently, but also thinking outside the box a little bit in the sense of bringing in people like Carrie and Dave who are also working in other food systems where I think, you know, the future and uh, could be found in the sense of the diversity of organisms that, you know, exist outside maybe the common ones we think about when it comes to wine microbiology. So what I'm going to do um, is just take four or five minutes to kind of set the stage for Lucy and Curia to follow um, and just um, introduce a few kind of points and concepts that I think would be you know, interesting to discuss um, in the latter half of, of today's meeting. 
So we're all, you know, intimately familiar with the idea that a wine fermentation is the result of a very complex community of, of microbes that interact um, in this special environment. And that special environment, you know, includes one that is, you know, low pH, high osmotic uh, pressure, uh, et cetera. And for that reason, selects this special community, which you can see from this graph on the right here that comes from uh, one of uh, Dr. Mill's publication uh, is highly dynamic and changes over time. You can see in blue here at the bottom, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, how you know it, it appears and then is, uh, disappears in proportion over the course of fermentation, malolactic fermentation of the final wine. And other organisms show other patterns, you know, maybe getting squeezed out by Saccharomyces in the mid-fermentation and returning. And other ones like this blue one here, which is Enococcus, uh, like most likely uh, taking over. So we understand that there is this complex relationship and the result, the end result of, of a wine fermentation and the sensory aspects of it um, are the result of all of these members of the community. And um, we know that there's large variability then when you think about site to site. So particular vineyards have uh, particular kind of um, microbes associated with the grapes and, the, and each winery as well has microbes associated with it. And for that reason, when um, juice is profiled, and this is a nice schematic that I just took, it happens to be from the New Zealand um, wine, area, uh, wine region. Uh, you can see here, you know, the composition of these juices are very different. There isn't kind of a common uh, composition. And as fermentation completes, you can see the composition again is, is dramatically different. And although um, you know, my, my expectation, I guess, coming into enology research was that at the end of a fermentation, you were going to be dominated um, by Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You can actually see many of these fermentations complete, uh, at least these two, where Saccharomyces is not um, the most dominant organism. So highly complex, uh, microbially, uh, varied in, in time and space, and for this reason, we get varying outcomes. And this is not a, you know, uh, the idea of controlling these populations of microbes and to get different outcomes is not new. This is just um, a review figure uh, taken from one publication where they list the combinations of strains and the impacts that they're seeing uh, when they're when they're used in a in a wine fermentation. And we're not going to go over all of these, obviously, but just to give you a sense that people have been thinking about um, the ability to manipulate these populations for a given uh, outcome. And the reason for these varied outcomes, of course, is the fact that each of these organisms can have their own activities. So it's just kind of additive in a, in a sense, and that's kind of explained in this part where it's just the simple additive features of those strains that gives a result. But of course, what's been kind of learned over the years uh, is that these microbes interact with one another, um, undergoing both synergistic and kind of negative interactions. Um, oftentimes you hear things like the, the, the term chemical warfare going on in the sense of, of these environments where the metabolites created by one yeast uh, can be used to impact another. And this could again be negative or positive. Positive, you know, maybe one yeast creates a metabolite that another yeast then consumes or negative in the sense of killer factors uh, from one yeast targeting another yeast population. Of course, this can result in uh, varied uh, yeast populations, their efficiencies as far as uh, fermentation kinetics, et cetera. And what we know is this, this is not just, you know, unique to one organism or kind of closely related organisms. Uh, there's been various publications over the years noting how yeast metabolism during the alcoholic fermentation can be inhibitory or stimulatory to the malolactic fermentation as well. So, you know, these, this environment and the environment as it changes over time will, will select for, for certain outcomes. And again, this is not a new idea in the sense of this 2012 um, review article had already kind of devoted uh, some, some time to talking about how the yeast selection that a winemaker may um, make in combination with activities selecting for certain non-saccharomyces yeast or performing mixed fermentations could be used to realize uh, many different outcomes, whether that's related to food safety, um, commercial trends trying to hit a sensory profile of interest, 
or more specifically uh, going after something like um, combating the effects of climate change, which I, I'm going to leave to Lucy to talk about a little bit more in, in her um, presentation as well. So the future, you know, in, in large part, I think, is going to be dealing with these um, combinations and going beyond, you know, a simple Saccharomyces inoculation to something much more uh, complicated, perhaps. Or maybe, you know, in discussion, we can talk about this, whether this is actually going back to a more native uh, type uh, fermentation where you let the microbes that are there um, go through their normal dynamics. Either way, um, commercial companies have realized in this and you can see here just the list of um, dried yeast products that are available that are not Saccharomyces cerevisiae but cover a number of different uh, organisms. So with that and talking about these organisms, what I'm going to do now is pass it uh, over to Lucy who's going to um, continue to talk about, you know, the application of these organisms in the context of, of a wine fermentation. I think, Lucy, I stopped sharing and you should be able to to pick up, hopefully. Am I up okay now? Yep, looks good. Okay, so um, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the non-Saccharomyces uh, yeast that you might want in your toolbox. And some of these have, um, you've seen before. Um, so uh, over the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of research done on different yeasts and how they affect fermentations, how they could be used in fermentation. So this is just a list of a lot of the species that have been looked at. I want to point out here the Lachancio thermotolerans, which used to be Cluveromyces thermotolerans, if you're looking at the older literature, and Stomerella bacillaris, which uh, used to be uh, Candida stellata or Zemplonina. And Though I was pointing those out in part because those are some of my favorite uh, organisms, as you'll see as I talk about some of these things. I um, want to talk first about some of the impacts climate change will have on uh, the fruit that's coming into the winery and the wine that is being made because of the higher temperatures, higher CO2, um, and the fact that a lot of winemakers prefer to pick based on um, phenolic ripeness as opposed to sugar ripeness. We're seeing higher alcohols being produced in a lot of wines, um, also lower acid in the fruit. Uh, we can see mouthfeel effects from some of these things and phenolic imbalances. And we also see aroma and flavor effects um, on the final product. Um, so some of the things that non-Saccharomyces have uh, been researched on and looking at things that they can address, some of the effects. One is the alcohol content. Another is the acidity. Um, also structure in terms of glycerol production and mannoprotein um, produced. And as well as uh, what's been studied most, which is aroma effects, the um, different compounds that affect aroma of uh, the wine. So in terms of lower ethanol production, uh, Saccharomyces is very efficient at converting sugar to ethanol. So what we're hoping for is to decrease the ethanol yields, to decrease the final um, ethanol content in the wine. And the question is, when you do that, where does the carbon go? Because the carbon doesn't just disappear. So um, the non-Saccharomyces yeast are actually not as efficient at ethanol production. And so often we see that carbon going into biomass, glycerol, um, organic acids or amino acids. Whereas when people have attempted to manipulate the Saccharomyces, we often see the increase in things like acetic acid and acetaldehyde rather than, uh, and those, those are things that you probably don't want in your product rather than going into some of these um, other carbon uh, compounds. So um, in terms of acidity, one of the, uh, again, my two favorite uh, non-Saccharomyces yeast here, the Lachancia thermotolerans and Stomerella bacillaris. We have looked at Lachancia um, in terms of uh, production of lactic acid in uh, beers. So we published a paper with uh, Charlie Bamforth 
looking at uh, making uh, acid beers with Latencio thermotolerance. And then uh, several breweries have approached us being interested in this. And we did some work with Sierra Nevada, um, looking at a bunch of different strains of Lachancia to see which ones might work the best. And that's something we need to keep in mind is that all of these yeasts, like Saccharomyces, will show st strain differences. And so picking the strain is gonna be important when you look at any of these yeasts. This table is just sort of a summary of the ethanol. These are the uh, yeast that I've looked at that decrease ethanol. And, and you can see all the different types of aroma characters that are produced. Let's go back. Um, and you can see here again, my favorite, the Lachancia that I like because it um, produces uh, lactic acid and can increase total acidity without increasing volatile acidity. It also affects certain uh, flavor compounds that are important. And the Starmorella, which um, produces quite a, quite a variety of different uh, flavor compounds as well as reducing alcohol. And this is one we have done a little playing with. When Melissa Pellini was the assistant winemaker in the winery, we made some mead with uh, Star Morella, which uh, was very popular amongst the people in the mead class. And it is a fructophilic yeast. It prefers fructose. So when it's, um, it's inoculated in conjunction with Saccharomyces, they don't compete that much because Saccharomyces goes after the glucose, Star Morella goes after the fructose. Another thing that we've looked at is the manoprotein effects Manoproteins can improve mouthfeel as well as increasing stability, both of tartrates and color or foam. And so manoproteins we looked at um, in conjunction with uh, um, Paula Demizio, who was working in Linda Bassan's lab. And we looked at a number of organisms. One that um, she brought with her from Italy was Schizosaccharomyces japonicus, which she is about to patent. So these are all um, yeasts that produce far more manoproteins than Saccharomyces, which does not produce uh, very high quantities of manoproteins. So it's always nice to have something else in there that can produce those manoproteins. We've um, traditionally manipulated this type of thing by doing cold soaks, where we allow some of the wild yeast to, to become established and produce some compounds prior to inoculation. And then finally, I just wanted to mention uh, some work that was being done in the winery last crush uh, with Lafort. Um, Daniel Dykus worked with our new winemaker, Leticia Chacon Rodriguez, on some biocontrol properties of some of their non Saccharomyces commercial yeasts, Toyolospora and Meshnikoya. And Ben mentioned the types of uh, competition that you see in these fermentations, both the passive and the active fermentations. And I can, you know, we could uh, give you um, some background on all of these, but uh, I think I will, in the interest of time, end it here. I'll turn it over to Kiria, who's gonna talk about collections. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lucy, for the great introduction, and Lucy and Ben for the great introduction about yeasts. Uh, so I'm going to step back a bit and talk more about collections in general and yeast collections in general. You going to share your screen? I failed to start. Let me try again. Mm. Please try again later. Please try again oh. later. Oh. Carrie, we'll wait. Just go ahead. <laughs> do, do <what> <laughs> Say that again? No, well, no, no. <laughs> I was just kidding. I said, well, wait, to... you take your time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too bad. I will. Do you see my screen now? No. Uh, no. no. Mm. Well, we tried this 20 minutes ago and it worked. Yeah, let me let me double check that you're still as a, you are still a co-host. So that's good. Share screen. Anybody have this on Zoom bingo? Sure it's it going. Yep. There you go. Okay, did it go now? Yep. All right. 
All right, so I'll give a, I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, so I am the curator of the other yeast collection here at UC Davis. Uh, yes, there is, there are two major yeast collections. I'm the, in the collection located in the food science department. So I'm in the next building over from Lucy and our offices are down the hall from each other. So I'm going to just briefly introduce the concept of biological collections. There are a range of collections. There's natural history museums. That, uh, that preserve dead specimens and then of mostly of plants and animals. And then there are living stock collections which preserve organisms all the way from microbes up to plants and animals and everything in between. If you would like to learn more about the collections here at UC Davis, the uh, 12 or so of the top collections, the most publicly visible ones, put on a public event every February and the two yeast collections are have a showcase next to the winery so you're invited to join us whether it'll be in person or virtual this coming year. So I'll just briefly describe yeast just to make sure we're all on the same page. Yeasts are single-celled fungi. There's about 2300 species right now that have valid scientific names but only about between 1% and 5% of yeast species have been brought into the lab and given a valid scientific name. They are used, in addition to make, for making wine, they are used in a broad range of industrial uh, applications as well as in basic research. In fact, since the year 2000, there have been five Nobel Prizes in physiology or medicine for basic life science concepts that were uh, discovered using yeast as a model organism. So they're really important in the laboratory as well. The yeast that are used for industry for uh, and for also for research are quite often acquired from culture collections. So there are a number of yeast culture collections around the world and their common mission is to acquire, characterize, preserve, and distribute microbes and also the information about them and expertise related to the strains. So some of the more well-known collections, there's an ATCC here in the US. Um, the NRL collection is the largest public microbe collection run by the USDA. There are, some of these collections are more specialized and some of them, for example, the DBVPG is a collection at the University of Perugia in Italy. And that has a large number, historically has focused on wine yeasts so that's a resource you might want to know about. NCYC in Norwich, UK, has historically has had a focus on brewing yeast. Uh, if you would like to know more about collections, uh, about a hun over 100 of the major microbe collections in the world have combined their catalogs all into one enormous catalog. It's called the Global Catalog of Microorganisms. So if you want to find a collection, out of these hundred collections all over the world that has a specific yeast species, for example. You can, you can search all their catalogs at once by going to the global catalog. Several years ago, I wrote a review article about yeast collections and I put together this table. I know it's kind of teeny tiny, but I just want to point out that I made a table of public collections that have at least 500 yeast strains. And there's less than 40 of them in the world. And two of them, are right here at UC Davis. So UC Davis it has for over 100 years at the University of California has been a major center of yeast research res resulted in two of the major collections in the world. Uh, the Pfaff collection is currently the fourth largest of these collections in the world. We have about 9,000 strains, about 1,000 species, and plus about 200 potential new species that don't have names yet. Uh, this collection was built over uh, primarily by my predecessor, Herman Pfaff. And he was a professor in the food science department from 1943 uh, until he, he was still working every day till he was 88 years old, until he passed away in 2001. And he started with a collection of about 500 yeasts from his predecessors and built that to over 6,000 yeasts. And he studied yeast ecology, starting in food applications and then going into, into uh, basic research on yeast ecology. And this photo shows 
how the majority of these yeasts were isolated. He has a petri plate in one hand and a sterile loop in the other. And he would collect some material, a certain plant species he was studying or a insect gut or whatever material, streak it on a petri plate and isolate the yeasts. Now, the reason I mention that is because that makes that the collection is biased towards yeasts that form colonies on plate on standard media on ambient conditions in a few days. So the co collection is biased towards yeasts that are easy to work with and easy to maintain. And I also want to point out that these are independent wild isolates. Each yeast in the collection originated from a specific uh, wild uh, habitat. They're not lab strains. Uh, this map shows the origin the, of the yeasts in the collection. The, the red stars are locations that FOF traveled to to collect yeast. And the blue stars are uh, the origin of yeast that we got from other researchers. We have uh, mostly over half the collection is yeast from various plants and insects. And um, of another third or so is foods and beverages, beverage processing facilities. And, and then a small proportion of the yeasts are lab strains, yeast from genome projects and clinical isolates. So we do have uh, a small number of yeasts. We have a few hundred yeasts from wine, uh, but the majority are from other foods and beverages, uh, fruits and vegetables, and other types of insects and plants. So this shows kind of a, the range of yeasts in the collection. So unlike the, the collection that Lucy described, which is focused on wine, our collection is a much broader a range of geographic origin and um, or habitat of the yeast. So we have a broader range of species. So what I do as a curator of this collection, my most important job is to keep the yeast alive. So I maintain the collection. We also distribute yeast to people around the world for a lot of different kinds of uses. And then I also use the collection in my research program. And we also do contract research for companies. So I'll give a really quick brief uh, review of my more recent projects in my own research program. And how most of these projects start is I pull out a large number of yeast strains and I screen them for some useful property. And then I pick the most promising strains and I might add in some of the taxonomic relatives of those species to see how common it is among those species. Because as Lucy mentioned, there is definitely uh, differences if you compare different strains of the same species. Uh, one area of research I've focused on lately is high oil strains. Um, and we happened to discover uh, that um, some of these high oil yeasts also secreted this weird sticky goo outside of the cells. And in addition to having 20 to 60 percent oil inside the cell, they had a large amount of this sticky goo that they secreted outside the cell and it turned out to be a new class of glycolipid molecules. Uh, we've also been studying ability of uh, yeast to consume the, the feedstocks from various waste streams and uh, we're currently writing a paper comparing the oil production by yeasts grown in corn stover, grape pomace, we, we, we have handled some grapes in my lab, uh, grape and tomato pomace, uh, switchgrass, corn stover, you know, a lot of different waste streams. Okay. So some of the recurring themes from these different, uh, uh, many different types of research projects is that different species, of course, have different properties, but also different strains of the same species have different properties. And that the if you're looking for a specific property, it often pays to look for a yeast that isol isolated from a habitat where it would need that property. So one example is I had a project looking for yeast that had a certain activity at low pH. The highest uh, performing yeast was originally isolated from citrus fruit juice. Right, so I also distribute yeasts for a broad range of uses. So unlike the, this, the collection Lucy described, my collection is used by researchers at government agencies, at industry, at academia for a lot of different uses. 
Uh, they can either use the intact yeast for basic biology, they can develop it as a production organism for industry, or use the living yeast, for example, for probiotic or for a biocontrol agent for agricultural pests. Uh, people also take apart these yeasts. Uh, we are in areas outside of wine research. Uh, these yeasts are used for genetic modification. So genes are taken out of our yeasts and put into somebody else's industrial organism, for example. And then also the yeasts are used to study production of different enzymes and other bulk and fine chemicals. So if anyone wants to access the FOF collection, we have an online catalog. People can, if they know what yeast they're going after, they can select it, put it in their cart and order it. Uh, I'm also very happy to help people select strains for specific properties based on my knowledge of the collection, the data associated with the yeast. We have 50 years of unpublished uh, descriptive data. And also I do contract screening for companies. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. So thank you. I think we can s probably stop sharing the screen. Yep. There. Uh -huh. Now, um, I think La Dave did say this, but uh, repetition is key. So if anybody has a question, and they or we may not have. Um, if anybody has a question, you can either just raise your hand physically or electronically and just ask a question, unmute yourself. Or you can type a question in the group chat and either myself or Dave will ask the question. And if you're shy, like always, I have plenty of questions to ask to follow up all the time. But please, you know, you don't want to just hear me and Dave. Um, although we can speak all day if you need us to. So I'm going to circle back to the first speaker, which was Ben. Um, I have a question. So what do we know about interspecies interactions in the context of wine fermentation? Um, yes, I, I touched on this, yeah, just very briefly in the sense that these, you know, these interactions can be positive, negative, or, or additive in a sense. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring this up is that I actually think that this is a, a general area that's generally a black box. We, these, these are incredibly complex environments. The number of metabolites and other compounds that these organisms secrete into their environment is is huge and we just don't know how um, they interact with each other to, to some degree. There was a recent um, publication that was quite interesting. Okay. I have a question for uh, Dave Mills because he's so silent there in that box that's right there. Um, so Dave you've, you've done a lot of work over the years with um, microbial ecology from the vineyard through to the winery, um, and I, I want, I'd like to hear a little bit about how much you think that microbial ecology affects the final product of, of the wine, and um, maybe a little insight on how you might be able to control that microbial ecology or whether you'd even want to. I'd be happy to talk about that, Dave, but I think we should let Ben finish Oops. his comment first. <laughs> oh, your sound is not coming up. Oh, Can you me. hear me? There you go. I'd be happy to talk, but I think, I think we should let. Yeah, I, I was curious about what happened there. I figure I froze or something like that. So uh, I would like to let Ben finish his comment, and then I'd be happy to talk about it. Yeah. Oh, were you not? Oh. Something. Someone must have froze. I, that's, right. I that's okay. That's okay. Um, so what I was just going to say is, yeah, there was one um, recent publication, quite interesting, where they simply took. Britannomyces and Saccharomyces and separated them by a impermeable membrane to cells and other things. So the only thing that could move back and forth are metabolites. Mm -hmm. And they actually saw that the Saccharomyces strains completely changes its behavior when it's in the presence of this other microorganism, even though they're not in physical contact. Um, so these organisms are paying attention, if you'd like to use that kind of terminology to what's going on in their environment and and for this reason I think changing their their activities quite dramatically. Um, we see this in, in fermentations here at UC Davis where 
Um, the presence of some lactobacillus uh, organisms seems to correlate with a change in how the Saccharomyces are metabolizing sugars, for instance, as well. So I think this general area is, is one for the future for sure, um, in the sense of trying to pick apart what these compounds are. And I think that's even more interesting uh, from the point of view that if we can uh, identify some of these compounds, there's then the potential for using those compounds, um, whether that's in biocontrol or other things. So um, I think it's, yeah, it's, an, it's a very interesting area and one that definitely needs further, you know, further study. And I think ties very well into the question, Dave, that you were asking the other Dave, which is, you know, how this whole community really impacts outcome and the, the microbiology that's going on, those consortium members. Yeah, I, I apologize, Ben. Somehow on, on my computer, you stopped talking and I thought, wait, <laughs> it's completely silent. What's going on? <laughs> no problem. No problem. Sorry about that. I, I thought you were just so eager to ask me a question. You just stopped him right well, in the middle too, of this. <laughs> but, but I like listening to Ben also. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, obviously, uh, uh, the revolution of the past 10 years in microbiology has been the tools to be able to witness uh, large amounts of microbial activity in the form of first with DNA based screens and now with a variety of other omics screens so that the resolution at which we can see microbial ecologies and their changing over time and their functions, the, in other words, the metabolites they produce, the glycans they produce, the uh, various components that are associated with them has increased uh, into insane mode. <laughs> where we don't have enough computers to handle all the data that we're generating. Um, and, and that's a fact of life for those of us who, who, who work in this area. What does that mean uh, for what we can learn about wine fermentations? Well, we, we've, uh, and this is driven mostly by Nick Bokulich back when he was in my lab. He's now a new professor in, in Zurich uh, and will be pursuing wine, wine research there as well. Um, and he, he was sort of the first who used some of these techniques to start mapping wine fermentations. We had some pretty poor rudimentary tools that we were able to use prior to that. But that helps us at first just to identify the organisms associated with some outcome. So the organisms at the start of a wine fermentation and you, asso and you, and you associate uh, that with uh, uh, the flavor of the wine or something like that. And it, so it started, it allowed us to start doing larger scale looks at actual wine fermentations at actual wineries instead of model fermentations. Uh, and so that, that gives us insight into what Ben very appropriately started this conversation on, which is, is non Saccharomyces stuff, uh, be it bacterial or, or yeast for that matter, uh, that can influence fermentations for good or bad. And, and I think, you can use the kind of data patterning that, that's generated out of the omics data that's coming out of various academics labs, at least in the parts of the world where it's being generated, and, and use that to make predictions on associations. And they are just that, they're associations. There's nothing more than associations. And we have to be extremely critical how we look at this information. Uh, because anybody that's gonna tell you that I'm gonna take a microbiome sample of, of an early stage of your wine and tell you what Parker score you're going to get is selling you something. Uh, and, and just as there is uh, overselling of the microbiome in the gut health world that I live and do research in now, uh, there is overselling of the microbiome in, in every food in, and beverage industry I know of. Uh, and so we, we need to walk slowly and carefully and, and scientifically through this. That doesn't mean there isn't absolutely large potential. So I do think we can start to understand interactions or at least identify top 10 most uh, organisms that are most likely to, to be associated with certain outcomes and, and start to bring those back in and then use exactly like Ben was showing, use them as adjunct cultures, et cetera. And I think that's, so I think adjunct cultures are a really interesting uh, uh, path. And the reason I bring that up is first, other industries had done this for a long time. Dairy industry has been using adjunct cultures for a long time. Um, but uh, uh, the wine industry only more recently have they actually commercialized sort of what you might call non-starter uh, uh, adjunct cultures. You have to test those out one at a time. 
but you could use omics strategies to identify clades of organisms that that are that provide a more rational basis for why you would pick any one organism. And I think for those two worlds are coming together at some point. Um, and so I see a future there. Dave, a quick, I want to make a quick comment. So basically, and just because the last few weeks I've had a lot of people interested in organic farming versus natural wine and that whole conversation is this thing about, you know, what's the most important? the microbium that you're getting from the vineyard versus the one in the winery. And I'm gonna think you're gonna tell me it depends because we've just talked about how, how the environment is really impacting um, what you're seeing, even for Saccharomyces, right? So um, I assume you could, will never be able to tell somebody which one is the most important because it depends on the specific vineyard, the specific combination of microbia that you have there. Yeah, that's a, it is a tough question. Uh, certainly the activities in the winery are, are sort of closest to the finished product. Let's put it that way. So that's certainly going to have an impact. That doesn't mean that obviously the physiology of the grape isn't primary on driving flavor. Um, but, but in a sense, the last microbes with the wine are the most likely candidates for, for leaving things behind in the wine. If we're talking about microbes influence on the wine. Uh, and so that's, by Occam's razor, I would start there first, shall we say. Uh, but that doesn't mean I don't think that the microbial ecology of the grape surface doesn't have an impact, because uh, of course it's, it delivers bugs into the winery. The question is, are they the bugs that actually persist and, and come through the wine? Yeah, so maybe I can comment on this too, because one, one study that's going on here at UC Davis is we refer to as the Pinot Project, which is a multi-year project where wines are being made here on campus using fruit from you know the same 15 vineyards across California and Oregon and in this case we've been following the microbiome uh, right at the end of cold soak before these wines are inoculated or before these musts are inoculated um, and what we're seeing is that um, the microbiome that's associated uh, with these musts are very strong identifiers of site. And this is something I think Dave and um, Nick Bokulich have, have published on before as well. And we can identify sites even at this very late stage um, in the sense of what is associated with these 15 sites. And the, the power of, I think, this study is that it is multi-vintage over covering five years. So we can maybe start to pull out some of these patterns um, that are emerging as far as, as Dave said, you know, the top 10, the top five, they're consistently associated year after year with the same um, outcome. So I think this is the types of studies that we're going to start to maybe get a toehold here because it is, it is such a complex environment that undoubtedly you can see patterns and other things, but picking out the pattern that's important from the pattern that's just Coral, you know, just a correlate with everything else that's going on becomes the true, true challenge. All right, I have to make sure that Ben has actually done this time before I ask another question. I'm, I'm all done, thank <laughs> you. All right, cool. So this, this is a question in the chat for Ben. Um, when attempting a fermentation restart, what population triggers a quorum sensing cell shutdown? I had one at 8.8 .8 times 10 to the six, six cells with 96% viable. Is that too many cells to which to add a new inoculum? So I think, yeah, so here there's, there's obviously different things to pull out of there, but I think generally to answer this in kind of a general way is that the problem with the cell shutdown or a fermentation that has become stuck, and obviously we can ask Lucy this as well, someone who has a lot of experience in these areas too, is that oftentimes at that point, there are signals being secreted by the yeast that are there dying or that ran into the problem that are now present in these juice or these musts. So yes, you can pitch new yeast into here and try to restart, but oftentimes as soon as those yeasts enter that environment, they see the same signals and they make the same kind of conclusion. Again, I'm using the, I'm kind of anthropomorphizing here and talking like they're people thinking, right? But they're making, they're coming to the same conclusion that this is a hostile environment for whatever reason and, and the restart um, may not work well. And Answering the question about, you know, at what points those change again comes back to the complexities of the environment and it's going to be situation to situation. It's almost impossible to argue or to, to suggest that at one cell density a restart is going to work and not. It's, it's kind of a, uh, in the context of, 
of each individual fermentation. Um, Lucy, I don't know, do you want to add anything? If Lucy's... I'm still here. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't really have much to add to that. I okay. don't think it's the number of cells so much as the state of the cells. So um, I'm sure Signa is familiar with all the different ways to restart stuff fermentations and to know that you have to get rid of, of the cells that are stuck as much as possible before trying to start things up again. Well, I know I'm not a panelist, but I would just add to that, that you know, in the work that we've done, we've been successful at getting to pretty high cell concentrations by specifically looking to do that. And part, part of it is the nutrient environment, right? So if you're adding new cells, you need to make sure that you're adding the nutrients to make those cells happy, regardless of what the old cells are doing. Um, okay, so we have another question, and I'm going to just give it any speaker that feels that they want to have a go at this one, go for it. Except, except any people that are focused on bacteria in their research might want to answer this one. Go ahead, Anita. Okay. Are Brettanomyces problems in wine more likely a winery or a vineyard problem? Could there be vineyards more prone to Brett problems? Oh, that's an easy one. All right, I, I apologize because I was reading the wrong question, sorry. <laughs> the next one. <laughs> There's another. Lucy, you're muted. Sorry, I think there are certainly some vineyards based on the nu nutrient aspects of the vineyard and the fruit that comes out of it that could be more prone to Brettanomyces. But I think more than anything, it's a winery issue, not a vineyard issue. So populations that are established in the winery are going to uh, persist, um, especially if you're using old barrels um, that may still have uh, Britannomyces in them. And then ironically, if you put that into a new barrel, uh, most of the Britannomyces can use that wood sugar and then you'll have even more issues uh, because now you're just feeding the Britannomyces that was there at low numbers to get high numbers. Um, anybody wants to add anything else? I think that pretty much cover. Okay, so, oh, it's Dave's turn. So I was just gonna, so this one is the one that I think that we should direct towards uh, Dave Mills, at least at first, and then others can chime in. Um, not much talk about wine bacteria. What about non enococcus wine, lactic acid bacteria like uh, lactic lactococcus plantarum and their potential role? Well, there's never much talk about wine bacteria. Wine bacteria. That's a normal uh, uh, outcome. So, um, uh, so two things. One, uh, one is uh, I'm assuming you're talking about for performing the malolactic fermentation and not for spoiling your wine. Uh, uh, yeah, because obviously the non enococcus lactic acid bacteria are also pretty famous for doing nasty things to your wine. Uh, every, you. excuse me, she said yes. yes. Okay, uh, so pretty much every lactic acid bacteria you isolate from wine is going to have a malolactic uh, or a malolactic enzyme. Pretty much every lactic you isolate from plant material is going to have that. Uh, and, and so they all have the ability to carry out the malolactic fermentation, whether you want them to do it or not is another question. There, there are products that are out there that are pre-fermentation or concurrent fermentation malolactic conversion starters. And I, uh, I know Charlie Edwards is on the call. He could probably answer this better than I am because I haven't been up on this lately, uh, but I thought their starter cultures for sale. I thought it was a plantarum strain. Lucy, you might know that too. Um, and so the, 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 the enococcus is exquisitely suited to survive the acid and alcohol. And it's actually one of the few lactics, along with a couple others that have a specific uh, NADP transhydrogenase. It's one of the things we discovered when we sequenced its genome. So we think that's part of the reason that it's particularly alcohol or can survive really well in alcohol because it, it operates slightly differently and, and has another way of pushing protons out. Um, and, and so it, it's hard to beat at lower pHs and, um, and higher alcohols, enococcus. So the other, other lactics are really thought of as for a pre-fermentation or a concurrent fermentation ML conversion. And then you worry about all the other baggage they carry in their genomes. So especially lactobacillus plantarum is famously large 
uh, lac, uh, genome, of, at least among lactobacilli. Uh, and so they can carry a lot of other things that can produce a lot of other end products that you really don't want in your wine. So I, I think this, there's always a risk of this. There's always a risk of hurting the yeast fermentation, the Saccharomyces fermentation. Um, and, and, but I have, uh, I'm speaking from uh, uh, probably five to seven years absence of thinking about this particular subject. Uh, so I do not know what the latest uh, Christian Hansen's or Lalamont products are that are uh, in this area. And I welcome anybody that knows anything to discuss it. There are, there are challenges for certainly. I just want to say that Enococcus is still probably the safest bet, as Dave was saying. Um, commercially, there's the plantarum strains. But again, just like with what we were talking about, strain differences with the yeast, you find strain differences in the bacteria as well. And that's really where you see differences in inoculum that you're producing or that are being produced commercially. Okay. Really uh, if I can, I'll, this is Charles Edwards uh, from hey, WSU. Hi, I'll comment on Dave's comment that uh, yes, plantarum is being studied, uh, but as far as I'm aware, it's still not legal for use in the US. I also wanted to make a comment on Dave's earlier thought, Dave Mills uh, thought related to um, losing of hair. Uh, I've easily uh, solved that, um, uh, you know, and I, I just have I, I get all sorts of compliments. I, I will tell you this. Actually, my wife gave me a COVID haircut last week, and uh, this is what I have. <laughs> I just had one of those uh, this weekend, too. Um, before uh, Okay. If possible, I'd like to follow up on, on, on two thoughts. One was uh, uh, Britannomyces in the vineyard. I absolutely agree with Lucy. I don't think it's a, necessarily a major uh, vector. However, we have done some work on survival of Brett in great pumice that was placed in the vineyard, and we could recover Brett after two years under our conditions, which, as you know, get, get pretty cold in, in, in the wintertime. So yes, it could be a potential vector. The one question I've gotten repeatedly that I don't think there's a good answer for yet is the role of composting and, and microbes and spoilage microbes. And I get a lot of folks uh, worldwide asking about, does composting do anything? Um, well, with your permission, I would like to add a, just a general question for all the speakers. Uh, I think that there is, a, I'd like to go back to the topic of today, which is the future of wine microbiology. And I think there's a lot of agreement that one of the hot areas has certainly been the role of non-Saccharomyces yeast. But there's a lot of other areas out there. Uh, one person made a, made a, uh, had a question related to uh, bacteria in wine. Uh, there's spoilage issues, Acetobacter, uh, Britannomyces, others, nutrient requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am wondering about the future of the discipline because what I'm seeing is that there are fewer wine microbiologists worldwide and funding has become an issue. It is, there aren't uh, as uh, a huge number of projects uh, through AVF and other sources that are currently being funded. I can almost count the number of wine microbiologists in the States uh, on one hand, maybe one and a half hands. So comments from the audience, please. Yeah, sure. I'd like to pick up on this one um, in the sense that, uh, so I've, I've been studying Saccharomyces cerevisiae for 20 plus years as a research scientist. And the largest focus of my work has always been on actually biomedical sciences, you know, using this as what we call a model organism for studying and understanding um, eukaryotic biology and in, in that way, human biology. And in coming to this position four years ago, I was tremendously excited about coming to a department where I don't have to say it's a model organism, right? This is the organism now to study in the context of a wine fermentation in, in large part. Um, but I, I echo your kind of feeling that, that the challenge really is that funding is hard to come by for this type of, of research. And, and the challenge there, and maybe this comes back to Curious' comment earlier, that there's been you know five Nobel prizes awarded for people working in yeast and using this as a tool, is there are tremendous technologies and tremendous knowledge of this organism, and with 
funding support and research monies, I think the future could be, you know, anything we want it to be really, you know, there is a tremendous amount of potential here, but it, it does, it does cost money to do that. And, and unfortunately, like you say, I don't, I, I, it's a challenge to find those funds and to find that support. So um, the question of what, whether there is going to be, you know, wine microbiologists in the future, you know, and, and what those numbers are is, is a, is a real, I, I agree, a real concern. I'm going to interrupt you guys for just a second to, to let people know that um, we're taking a little bit of a hiatus from office hours with David and Anita. This is our, going to be our last program for a while. However, having said that, um, we've had really good attendance over, this is what, the ninth week? Tenth, tenth week, which is great. And uh, we, we do want to continue this at some point in the future. So if people have ideas for programs that they'd like to hear about, please email Karen Block, KL Block at ucdavis.edu, or you can also email me or Anita um, to send your ideas, and we will continue these in the future. However, um, over the next few weeks, we'll be doing a bunch of at least virtual regional programs, whatever that means. And I'm going to let Karen talk briefly about uh, when they are so you can look for those programs coming your way as well. All right. So uh, coming up, we have our virtually on the road programs. Uh, the first one is on July 13th. Um, and it's actually in conjunction with uh, folks down in San Joaquin County at the Lodi Wine Grape Commission. If you are interested in listening, you can um, you can email me and I can get you the, um, the Zoom uh, for that. And I can also just send that Zoom out as well um, on our extension list. Um, and that's on July 13th and it's from two to four in the afternoon. We're also gonna be doing a program with the Napa Valley Vintners. Um, that's on July 15 and 16. It's two days and it's just two hours each day from 10 to 12 each day. And if you'd like more information on that, um, if you, uh, I don't have the link yet. Actually, the Napa Valley Vintners are gonna be providing that link. So you'd have to ask them for the link. And then a third program on the 27th of July, we're working out our final details there, but that'll be with folks down in Stanislaus County. Um, and so you can join us for that. Just email me and I'll give you any information we have when we get it. So that's about for our month of July, we have those programs coming up. Great, so um, just continuing on, we, we have only have a couple minutes left, but continuing on what Char Charlie was asking the panelists, I would just uh, add to that um, a couple of the comments in chat that said, you know, what is what do genetically modified organisms um, have to do with the future of microbiology and wine microbiology. And so I was wondering if uh, someone can address that maybe as the, as the last question we'll have for the show today. Do you mind if I share my screen, Dave, for a second? I got. Go I can show you one thing and kind of thinking about this question that was going to, to come up. Um, and this kind of builds off maybe Charlie's question as well, too, about funding in these areas and Obviously, the, the question of genetically modified organisms is one that um, is complicated by societal issues, consumer preferences, and whether industry is willing to um, use these organisms. But there is a potential in the future, and I think part of the answer is going to be what pressures the industry faces in the future. Um, but to give people some idea of what is possible, um, you know, this is an application, of, a research article that was published two years ago, where through the use of light, they could switch um, production in a, in a genetically modified organism from, from biomass production and ethanol production to isobutanol production. So this is more of a, um, a kind of a, for, you know, a, an application outside wine, but the, the same thing could be true. And I actually saw an abstract recently where someone showed that they could use light to cause yeast to flocculate. So imagine a fermentation condition where you're doing the fermentation, you're at the end and you want to get rid of the yeast and you shine a light on them and they all clump together and fall to the bottom. Um, you know, here's another one where Charlie Bamforth is involved in this and Jay Kiesling at UC Berkeley is the lead on this where they've are producing hot flavor compounds inside a, an engineered uh, yeast strain. So, you know, there is this potential, obviously, for using these types of approaches and using genetic engineering to produce strains with optimized kind of abilities, if you'd like to, yeah, think about it in that way. But, you know, I, I think, you know, the people on the line may be able to comment how, you know, kind of receptive 
you know, the, the consumers may be of this or the industry may be of this. Well, unfortunately, I hear the theme music coming uh -oh. out. Uh -oh. <laughs> We're being faded out. Now, if there's only the lights, you could just shut on the lights and everybody has to leave. Uh, so that is my cue. Um, because I'm suppo supposed to say uh, thank you and goodbye. So I would like to thank our speakers, Lucy, Kiria, Ben, and David Moles, just to be specific. Charlie for also contributing um, indirectly. And I like the hat. Thank you very much for joining us and supporting this program. We um, send us ideas and we will come up with a new agenda list and office hours for the future. It's a great way to stay in contact. Um, and we will let you know. We will send out as soon as we have plans. We're taking a little bit of a break just so that we can do all our regional programs as well, which is regional line. So that's uh, something new. And it's harvest time. But we'll see if we can do something in between before or between harvest and the end of the year. We I'll send you the website, Dave Mills, that, that you can get one of these <laughs> so that you can really help with not having to wear a hat, that kind of thing. He's got the cheese head, though, so that works, too. Uh, I, I, somewhere in my office. <laughs> I'll just point out that someone asked about um, recording. We have recorded these. Um, the link is at the bottom of the email that Karen sent out. You can also email Karen at the, the contact, uh, the email that she put in the chat and she can send you the link as well. So you can go back and enjoy them as many times as you want. Um, so again, uh, I also wanna thank Karen for organizing all of these. We show up and do the show, but Karen's mm -hmm. actually been the one organizing them and corralling all the speakers. So I appreciate that as well. And we'll see you at the next Office Hours with Dave and Anita. Whenever that may be. <laughs> Goodbye, have a good day and week.